uh, wonderful. I also know that Vandana is perhaps here. Uh, yes, so Vandana is here. Hi, Bhavna. Hi. Good to see you here. Very good to see you. Good to see you. So, uh, and those of you who I have not known so far, I hope that uh, this will be a beginning of a friendship and a relationship. So thank you. Um, very glad that you're a part of Arohan. And um, I'm going to share my screen so that, um, just give me a second, we can also have some visual aid to what is it that I'm trying to say. Um, but hopefully this is more an interaction and more an exchange, mm -hmm. less of what I have to say. Uh, I am sure that much of what I have to say is something that you have a lived experience of. But it is always worthwhile to take a step back and to look at some abstractions, some concepts, and see how one can look at our roles, whether it is as a caregiver or as an agent of change, what is it that we are affected by? And what might we need to do in order for us to um, to be effective, sustainable, and uh, humane. So I do think that uh, the healthcare profession is um, extraordinarily demanding. So uh, it might be worthwhile that we build certain capacity to understand all the stakeholders and to take care of ourselves because in today's language, hashtag we are all caregivers. Uh, I have a teenage daughter, so I'm trying to be very cool as far as she's concerned, but she thinks I'm not so cool. Uh, so I'm talking in hashtags these days. Uh, I would love to hear from you and I would like for this to be interactive. So please use the chat box and leave your comments as we, I take you through the presentation. I'm notorious for not managing my time well. So I'm going to request Manisha or Rajalakshmi to help me stay on track. I might get carried away. So, you know, give me a warning bell about if I go overboard. Yeah? Sure. That's going to be my self-care practice today. All right. So um, I'm going to request you to use the chat box and say, what is it that you're expecting from this session today? So if you can just um, leave a sentence, a word or a thought that you have, it will give me a sense of where you are. And uh, we can always modify the session depending on what you're expecting and what you are looking for. Uh, Ma'am, we do have comments coming in. Yes, I can. I can look at them. Don't worry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Okay. So. Yeah. Let, does one of you want to read it or should I read it? I'm sure all of you can read the chat box yourself, but I am grateful that you're sharing this because it helps build a certain environment in terms of expectations from the session and what is it that we can uh, look at achieving today. Um, it's an interesting question, Avtar, about what does solace mean to a caregiver? Maybe uh, that is something beyond uh, what I have prepared but we can take it up. So uh, in case you have a question or an expectation that doesn't get covered in my presentation, we will have a question answer session and we can take it up there. Uh, the theme with which I have prepared today's session is looking after yourself when you are affecting change. 
So that's the core theme. And as caregivers or as healthcare practitioners, there is something that we need to understand or we need to be mindful of. So what is the role of yourself when you are an instrument of change? In order to understand that, there is, it is important that we understand the system as a whole. So get a sense of what is the context of a caregiver. So therefore, understand for in order for you to be effective as a change agent, understanding who I am and the significance of your self-awareness as you are being a catalyst for change. What is a catalyst for change, et cetera, is something that we will pick up. What are the dynamics of self-care? Is there an element that is psychosocial or cultural? Uh, well-being as a whole has many elements and uh, there is one particular framework that we use in caregiver sati and that's the one that I'm going to reference here. I am sure you are aware of many others and each one is valid in its own way. We will also do a brief reference to understanding in this context of well-being, what is stress, what is potentially burnout, and how can you and I build practices of resilience? Uh, if at any point in time you want to ask a question, you can leave it in the chat box and I'm going to request either Manisha or Rajalakshmi to uh, let me know if there's a question and we can pick it up. Is that okay? Uh, yes, ma'am, it is. Thank you. All right. So let's have a look at this. And I want you to read this slide from left to right. The context of the family caregiver here, the context of the family caregiver is complex. It is diverse and it has a range of unrecognized challenges. None of this might be new to you but it's worthwhile to take a bird's eye view or an abstract location to understand what is it that a caregiver is enduring. The socio-cultural context is that, that in urban uh, setups more than rural, but increasingly there are nuclear families. Communities are fragmenting and the expectations from family for caregiving continues. Caregiving is a gendered role and uh, we are in deeply embedded in a fairly patriarchal society, which means that care related work is often done by women and is unpaid uh, in many ways, often ignored and invisible. 60 to 80% of the caregivers are women. This is a phenomenon that is true worldwide and incre uh, certainly heightened in India. When you look at the context of terminal illness or chronic conditions, the role of the doctor is very different and significantly less. However, the influence is high. What that means is that the patient and the family relies significantly on the doctor, but the doctor can do that much and only that much. However, the unrecognized caregiver trauma or burden is very high. Some of the mental health implications for family caregivers is the burden leads to stress, can potentially lead to caregiver depression. Caregivers grapple with grief in general and anticipatory grief in particular. The definition of anticipatory grief is that grief which is in anticipation. So uh, the, the socio-cultural understanding of um, grief is that, you know, it should happen when there is loss. However, in the case of terminal illness, the loss is still anticipated or the loss of um, dreams or the loss of 
potentially a relationship is not so easily recognized. Um, most significant is compassion fatigue, which is long-term care can mean that the caregiver can run out of compassion. And there is only that much that you can run on um, duty and the adrenaline and the desire to be noble. So uh, there is compassion fatigue. And um, increasingly, we live in an environment or society where um, emotions are categorized as positive or negative, and certain emotions like guilt, anger, or frustration is considered a quote-unquote negative emotion. And if it is a negative emotion, then very often we find that family caregivers find it very, very hard to express it in a way that they will not feel judged for it. So caregiving is invisible, often unrecognized, underappreciated, underserved, and deprioritized. And very often caregivers deprioritize their own needs more than anyone else. So uh, this is something we need to understand is the world that caregivers uh, are in. Sorry. Uh, sorry, ma'am, for the interruption. Uh, we can hear a buzzing sound from your end. Uh, is there, you see a phone nearby to your system or something? No. That is not from my end. Everybody else is on mute, right? Everybody else is on mute. Okay, so... A kind of buzzing sound is... From, your voice is clear, we can hear it, but still there is a background buzzing sound coming. I have my fan on. Uh, Ma'am, it's when you uh, start speaking, the sound comes. If you're not speaking, the sound is not there. So uh. I don't know how to fix that. Um, uh, th does it continue to be there? Do I, maybe you know what I can do is I can connect a mic. Hang on. OK. In terms of understanding the context of the caregiver, one of the other things that I'd like to highlight is very often there is a sense of urgency, a compulsion, and a caregiver is often fraught with dilemmas. Dilemmas as in catch-22 situations as having to make choices between two equally important uh, or two equally relevant uh, ways or approaches. Uh, for example, self-care versus patient care. Who can I talk to? Who will understand me? Um, can I take my caregiving responsibility to the workplace? And do I have to, if I'm a good caregiver, do I have to do everything myself? Or can I have someone else do some parts of the caregiving? And finally, where can I get the information so that I can make decisions quickly? We live in a world where there are there is enough information. And in fact, it's an information overload. However, that relevant information that I need at this point in time to be able to make the right decision now can sometimes be a challenge for a caregiver. So just doing another audio check, is this, is it, is it the same? No, it remains to be the same only now. Oh. But it's okay, we can clearly make it up. Okay, I'm very sorry about this. I have no control and I have no way of fixing it so far. All right. One of the most important things that I'd like to highlight and that I think that as uh, professional caregivers or as healthcare practitioners, we need to have a good map of is to recognize the system as a whole. Now, this is also the engagement model for Caregiver Sati, where we kind of are mindful of all the stakeholders that are involved in the life of a caregiver, so to speak. So the most important dyad is the caregiver and the patient or the care receiver. 
both are dependent on each other very often uh, because caregiving is not distributed over a large number of people. It is the primary caregiver that we're talking about here. Please feel free to leave your comments or observations or questions, just a reminder, and we will pick them up. Now let's look at the world of uh, this diet. Uh, the most important uh, influencers are the doctors, healthcare practitioners, friends and family, and colleagues and managers. Each of these people, while these are individuals or roles around these, uh, this diet, all of them are parts of systems, which is hospitals, healthcare institutions, society, clubs, community, or workplaces and organizations. Um, there is a, a connectivity, a need to bridge this together. And we hope that through the work that we are doing at Caregiver Sati by building um, our organization, we are helping look at the needs of caregivers. Um, there is a need for communication, research, partnering with other organizations, looking at educational institutions, and of course, uh, the government. But it is suffice to say that this is the stakeholder map or the set of stakeholders that can potentially directly or indirectly impact the caregiver and the care receiver on an ongoing basis. If we have a good understanding of this, we will be able to situate our role in a manner that is effective, not just in being efficient, but in being sustainable as well. Now, simultaneously, it is important to understand what is the lens or the context for the professional caregiver? The social context is that doctors are considered next to God or you know, their advice is the expert's advice. Nobody challenges that. Uh, however, we know and the pandemic has only heightened the fact that the infrastructure is severely constrained. Uh, we live in a society where making money versus uh, healing and caring is of greater importance. And um, doctors or healthcare workers sometimes have to go on through an ongoing and long academic training. There are significant mental health and stress conditions. So there is a need to not just build your skill or competence around the disease and what needs to be done for cure, but also for emotional intelligence for uh, building endurance and coping in an experiential sort of way. What could be some of the typical phenomena that can impact healthcare workers, specifically physicians and doctors? They can be potentially a numbing emotionally. There can be circumstances where you're told that you will be efficient and you will be able to cope better if you are able to distance yourself from the person, the illness, and the circumstances, which will lead to the emotional numbing. There is a distinct possibility of a burnout, compassion fatigue once again, and compensation by looking at ways and means of earning wealth, and of course, physician depression, or this could be any you know, depression of any kind, in terms of the futility uh, and the gap between the expectations that the client, the, customer, the, the patient has versus the helplessness sometimes the caregivers feel. So when there is a wide gap, it can lead to potentially um, depression. So doctors and healthcare workers have to learn to cope and endure and deal with stress um, and respond to societal expectations of being experts this means often compromising on self-care. When you're a healthcare worker and you're looking at palliative care or you're looking at circumstances in which cure, which everybody's looking forward to and long life that everyone is looking forward to is not a possibility, then the healthcare worker is potentially a catalyst of change. 
who is a catalyst? If you look at, I'm sure many of you have studied uh, chemistry. And if you look at the definition of a catalyst, a catalyst is that element which is used in a chemical reaction to ensure that the chemical reaction is faster or more efficient. But what happens to the catalyst is it participates in the process, but regains, shape, regains its original self once the reaction is over. Now, if you were to apply this concept of chemistry to the lives of a healthcare worker or a professional caregiver, whether it's a healthcare worker or a physician or a doctor or whoever else, you are a catalyst for change. A catalyst means that you participate in that process, but you also have the resilience and the capability to let that reaction happen or let that sequence of events happen, but have the ability to regain your original self so that you are then available for the next um, because burnout is not really an option. But it would be really sad if it were, there was a burnout. So uh, in order to understand change, it is important to accept that what does it mean for your role as a change agent and a catalyst of change? I would like to highlight that as a catalyst of change, which each one of you is, and will be as messengers of palliative care or as people who will want to shift the understanding of health, care, life, well-being, uh, when there is perhaps no cure, then in your role as a catalyst of change, it is one of the most significant things is the quality of self-awareness that you hold. And this has to be a practice that you have to uh, have on a regular basis. One of the ways of building your self-awareness is to constantly go through what I call the cycle of awareness. In this cycle of awareness, given a situation, let's say you're faced with a situation, you take stock by saying, who am I? which means what kind of a person am I? What's my life story? What are my preferences? Where do I come from? So who am I and why am I here? What's the purpose of this interaction? What is the context? So what is the, you know, everything else that's happening here? And at this point, what is the issue? So what is it that I'm dealing with at this point in time? Who are the stakeholders who could potentially be impacted or are decision makers? Now, I will have multiple things to do. So what will I do? What are the choices that I have? And I will pick one. And the thing is that whichever choice that you pick, there will be a consequence. So there isn't ever an ideal and a perfect solution. You pick the one that seems the best given your life experience, your best judgment, et cetera. But whatever choice you pick, it will affect the situation and it will affect you. That which affects us informs who I am for the next experience that we have. And once again, in the next situation, you go through the same cycle again. If you go through your experience of cycle, this cycle of uh, you know, um, experience or awareness with a certain quality of mindfulness, with a certain quality of thoughtfulness, then you will be able to practice compassion a lot easier than it feeling like it's a draw on you. So, who am I? What kind of a person am I? What defines me? Where do I come from? What are my unique life experiences? Who do I wish to be? What are my likes, dislikes, preferences? And the most important one being how do I learn and when do I learn? Your significant self-awareness hinges on this question and only you know the answer to this question. I'm being 
aware of when am I the most authentic or true to myself. Keeping this um, can be a or is the most important starting point. So what does self-care look like? Can I request you to, I will look at the chat box and ask you to comment. What is self-care? Mm -hmm. I like that, Avtar. Yes, Sandhya. So I read a beautiful article recently which said <coughs> that the act of self-care should not be misunderstood as an act of indulgence. It is not something that you do once in a while and you do to any extreme. Self-care is a discipline and it is a way of looking after yourself on a daily basis. Yes, Vandana, absolutely. The practice of taking steps to preserve or improve one's own overall health. Um, that said, there could be many ways of looking at self-care and practicing uh, self-care. Yes, uh, Moshmi, I agree with you that it is a continuous ongoing uh, process. Um, so just as we care for the people that we interact with, how much do you invest in caring for yourself and that requires understanding and appreciating not just having an awareness of who you are, but also recognizing what your boundaries and limits are. So to be able to take a step back, to be able to take help when required, to be able to replenish oneself through hobbies, through time off and understanding your needs, and asking for what you need by setting boundaries for yourself, by replenishing oneself and being able to say no at the right time. And should something not go as ideal, being able to forgive and let go are all practices of self-care. And one of the ways in which this can be practiced is that if you can have the discipline of maintaining a daily journal. So I would strongly recommend that you maintain a daily journal in which you record what three things every day. What did I do? How do I feel? And what did I learn? If you can keep these three questions alive, you can care for yourself. Any comments or questions? If none, then we will quickly look at what is the elements of well being and how can we understand our own well being? At the core of each person, whether it is a professional caregiver or it is a family caregiver or it is a patient, frankly, uh, is three elements, your physiological, spiritual and psychological well-being. These are inward looking elements. And then in terms of interface with others or the society is social well-being financial well-being, legal well-being, life and work purpose. And all of this in terms of your ability to express yourself uniquely is held by the seventh element, which is creative expression. Now, in the overall scheme of well-being, the way that we look at it is that 
why if i were to ask you to rate your well being on a scale of 1 to 10 where would you rate it um you could rate it at any number that you think right it is not a point of comparison and it is not like a thermometer where one number is valid for anyone else it is your assessment of where you are if you put a number to your well being and you wanted to let's say you were at 6 today and you wanted to move to eight, how would you move a score of six on your overall well-being to a score of eight? The way that we feel that you can move your overall well-being from six to eight is by breaking down and understanding your well-being through its various elements. On our website, we also have a provision for uh, an individual stress and burnout assessment tool. Should any one of you be interested, you could write in and we could help you with that as well. Now, taking that report will give you an assessment on the seven elements of well-being and help you understand um, that an imbalance in your well-being is what causes stress. So there might be some of the elements that are actually enabling you and some that are derailing. And that's true for all of us. Some things are working for us and some things are not. And if the derailers are greater than the enablers, then you know there is greater stress. However, if the enablers are greater than the derailers, then maybe the stress is managed. And um, if the stress is chronic and it is unaddressed over a long period of time, it can lead to mental health issues. What can you and I do? You and I can invest in ourselves by building practices of resilience. These are practices of mind, body, and soul. Um, it is important to stay in touch with a few um, realities, which is how do you see your role? Do you see your role as a caregiver or a caretaker? Do you understand caregiver burnout? What kind of a caregiver are you? which means what is your psychological framework in which you are a caregiver? Do you see it as a duty? Do you see it as a noble act? Do you see it as something that you were burdened with? And all of these contribute to um, both your stress and resilience. Uh, recognizing what is the life stage of the caregiver and the care receiver and that various permutations and combinations can uh, needs to be in your um, vision, recognizing which phase of caregiving you're in, which means has caregiving just landed on your lap? Is it the beginning of caregiving? Are you in the thick of it? Or are you nearing the end? Depending on which phase of caregiving you are, different kind of attention needs to be paid. And finally, recognizing and appreciating the seven elements of caregiver well-being. Please remember your resilience is a function of how disciplined you are with your adaptability, your learning ability and learning agility. Now resilience and this view of resilience is a whole separate chapter and uh, maybe we can pick that up another time beyond the scope of the conversation today. But just leaving it here for uh, triggering your curiosity. To bring it in, some of the practices that you can have which can build your resilience in addition to understanding self-care would be having daily rituals, having the time off for your reflections. Now that cycle of experience that I spoke about in terms of who am I, why am I here, etc., can be hard to practice in the moment. So what I would recommend is that you do it as a part of your reflections or journaling exercise. And over a period of time, it becomes so much a part of you that it becomes a practice and it will become something that will come naturally to you. Experiments, experiment with yourself. 
uh, experiment what else you can be, how else you can be present, and above all, be kind to oneself because hashtag we are all caregivers. So, um, <laughs> we are all healers as well. And before we can heal anyone else, we need to heal ourselves. Um, with that, uh, I hope I didn't bust my timeline. I am happy to take any questions or discussion points that you may have. Uh, Bhavana, I just want to ask a question as before. Isn't anger a part of caregiver's emotion? So what is your scene on that? Um, anger is certainly a part of, um, so in the expression of emotions, I think uh, there was that the context of the caregiver, it says guilt, anger, frustration, shame, feelings like that. Yes, it is. Most certainly, it's quite possible that um, caregivers express anger much easier than um, any other emotion. And uh, I believe that people express anger because they are really very sad and they don't know how to express their grief and sadness. So the way it comes out is frustration and anger, but actually if you delay it, it is really sadness and grief. Does that address the question? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, thank you, Bhavana, for that excellent presentation. I really wish uh, us tell everyone to come up with questions. So there is a question how resilience can be built. So um, I, we spoke about that, right? The resilience can be built by looking at each element of well-being. Look at your core, which is physiological, psychological, and spiritual well-being, and uh, have daily practices or discipline of reflections, kindness, your awareness, and um, rituals. So knowing that your day begins in a certain way, it ends in a certain way, these rituals or doing rituals on a regular basis, on a monthly, on a yearly basis can be ways of building resilience. Um, I think Rajni is saying something which I haven't been able to track. Can you help me with that? Rajni, would you like to ask your question in person? I think she was mentioning about the anger part you just conveyed. Yes. Hi, can I ask the question? Yes, please. Yeah, hi. Um, basically, what I was asking was regarding the caregiver and uh, their anger. I agree. Every all the emotions they go to uh, with full respect, they do have a right to go through that and all those things. But from the perspective of an intensivist, um, most of the reactions I would I'm not exaggerating when I say it's more than 75 percent of the time. There'll be one specific person who will uh, you know who will consider themselves a caregiver of that patient. And then they will come and they get very angry with the, at the doctors, you know. So, and we kind of are, uh, we, we are very uh, gentle with them thinking that it, they are entitled to. So, that is where that question stems from. If you think about it, you know, doc, are doctors the only source of their uh, outlet to break that anger? That's what uh, the question was, basically. Is that correct or wrong? I'm not really sure. Um, you know, it's a, it's a complex um, situation to solve, Rajni. One is that uh, most of our healthcare systems and our healthcare approach is not designed for the caregiver at all, especially the family caregiver. 
So I've had such, you know, instances when people have said that, you know, there was a time when our healthcare system was designed more from the physician point of view or the disease point of view, which is slowly shifting to the patient point of view, but it is still not the caregiver point of view. And the caregiver ends up holding the burden of the illness, the caregiving, and not just during that period, but even after the loss of whatever, the loss of not just the person, but sometimes, you know, a healthy person, maybe an earning member and so on and so forth. Um, from uh, an emotional and psychological point of view, we can express compassion by recognizing that anger comes from a place of unexpressed grief or sadness. And there may be something that we need to do in how we manage the patients and the families. And, and you know, that's why it's a complex problem because it requires healthcare systems that have very different infrastructure and so on and so forth, uh, which can help manage the uh, anger of the caregivers. But I totally understand that also that physicians um, have so much to do and so much to learn that to build uh, an ability to be able to counter anger, etc., can be an additional um, you know, whole process. So maybe some support is required to be able to manage the caregivers. It's a problem to be solved. So uh, I yeah, would like. Thank you. Yeah. So I would like to share something here, uh, Bhavna, from yeah. my uh, experience at uh, with cancer patients. Mm. Once uh, I had to counsel a father was 24 year old went in for a surgery and there was metastasis and doctors said that uh, I mean they couldn't really do anything he went in, he was angry he brought the entire OPD down for 40 minutes I just heard him out it was so much of anger so much of anguish so much of grief and for people around it sounded as if it was just anger but like you said it was mostly grief it was mostly helplessness after 40 minutes, he says, I am sorry. It was just an outburst. I did not know how to express myself. So it was just, I think probably sometimes they just went out of helplessness. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, that's one of the experiences that uh, I've had with caregivers in terms of anger. See, um, my guess is, and I'm here I'm making a guess, but there could be circumstances in which, you know, the doctors are doing their best as well. So they have a sense of helplessness themselves because maybe they are not able to do more and they really wish to do more. And the caregivers are going through their own pain and they are expecting the doctor to be God and be the answer. And it's a question of these two things simultaneously happening, right? Now that's, that can be a fairly emotionally intense moment where both the, you know, the doctor is going through their own sense of utility, their sense of helplessness, their desire to do their best and so on and not being able to do and wanting to convey something that the other person is not understanding because they are caught in their grief and they are caught in their sadness. And there's a gap, right? Now, Oftentimes, anger and expression of anger is really a scream for help. It's really, you know, the children throw tantrums because they, they want to be hugged, really. Um, so um, I feel that it is many things have to be touched so that the anger of the caregiver can be managed. Right? So it's a systemic. Uh, yeah. I wish I had a little. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I also feel that, you know, physicians, the doctors do, no, no doctor wants to hurt any patient. But uh, again, like you said, it's got to be a systemic thing. So there has got to be interdisciplinary uh, setup where a doctor can get a counselor on board and 
help the counselor explain it to the patient because uh, but then uh, that somehow is missing in our system. Right? Yeah. Still, still need to work on yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Fafna. Yeah. So, um, did the person who wanted to ask the question on how resilience can be built um, get the answer? Motion. Uh, yes, ma'am, she found the answer. Okay. You know, it's a large subject and uh, interestingly, because of the pandemic, the whole idea of resilience and building resilience has come up in so many forms and ways. But I do think that if you understand uh, it like this, this is how I have made meaning of it which is that we are catalysts and we have to find a way of regaining our form and shape. The way to regain our form and shape is to have rituals and have reflections and have self-care practices that allow for kindness uh, on a daily basis. It's not that act of self-indulgence that you, know, you will have salt and hot water bath or you know, you go out for a vacation after two months. That's not self-care. Absolutely. Uh, so acceptance. So the point uh, in the chat is that does acceptance help in building resilience? So here's how I will place it. In my mind, if, you know, so, so, so being in touch with, so, you know, there is a cycle of life. Uh, I have been dealt the cards that I have been dealt. If I can have the acceptance, and that's where you understand the five stages of grief, that there is a very long period of denial, right? So the person is going through grief and the person is going through denial. And the person is, until you get to the point of acceptance, you cannot look at saying, okay, now how do I make the best of what I have? So yes, long answer, but yes, acceptance. And uh, I will just make a link. Acceptance has a lot to do with your spiritual well-being. So whatever your faith, whatever your way of looking at life, whatever your spiritual well-being is, that will help you resolve or get to the point of acceptance. And once there is acceptance, then the ability to look at, okay, can I look back at my caregiving experience? It was what it was. Um, what has it taught me? What can I do for myself? What can I do for others? How can I still live a full life? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, can be points of inflection that can lead for transformation. Those are that's like a full another lecture, and maybe we can have that conversation. But yes, acceptance is essential, and acceptance is an element of spiritual well-being, and it helps in building resilience. The fact is that we are dealing with death and dying. And the fact is that death and dying is the only reality that we have to all contend with. It's a harsh one. Raj Lakshmi. Um, I guess, huh? uh, so any more questions anyone wish to ask? Any other questions, any observations, any feedback on the presentation? Was this aligned with what you were looking for? Um, if there are any questions, can I ask you one? Like yeah. we have heard about caregiver sati a lot. So as part of your organization, what will you do for making people aware about self-care element as such? Like any programs or workshop you do for caregivers? Mm. Uh, can you brief about it? 
it's a good point. Uh, what we do is we provide uh, caregiver coaching. So caregivers can sign up for a six to nine session coaching, one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching program. And uh, we are planning to launch a coaches program. So all those who have been uh, caregivers and have the life experience of being caregivers, but the caregiving journey is over, you can apply for this program and we will go through a selection process. And if we feel that you're ready, then we take you through um, a certification program in which we equip you to be a coach to a caregiver, right? Now, as a part of that exercise, we are looking at, uh, so we communicate, so there's a training program on self-care practices. There's a training program on resilience building. There's a program on becoming a caregiver coach. And there is also a program <clears throat> to help understand what you can do as a well-wisher of a caregiver. Very often, well-wishers of caregivers don't know even how to have a regular conversation or a conversation in the eventuality of, let's say, an event or let's say even death. Uh, so knowing how to interact with a caregiver can also be a skill which has to be learned. So those are the kind of programs that we offer. Um, we do webinars. So every other Friday. So the reason that I was okay for this Friday was that we are not having a webinar today, but usually 4 to 5.30 every other Friday, we have a webinar series where experts talk to the topic of compassionate caring. So if you remember the five top dilemmas that I spoke about, in which we said, how do you balance self-care versus patient care? Then the caregiver sati approach is that you can balance self-care and patient care through information and learning certain practices. So our webinars are designed around the seven elements of well-being, and they are aimed at teaching caregivers on how to be able to care for yourself, be able to care for the caregiver, and be able to take care of pragmatics like financial legal well-being, social well-being, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those of you who may be interacting with family caregivers, you could direct them to register for um, the getting the regular newsletters, podcasts, videos, webinars, and uh, there are a wide range of resources that are available on our website. And you could also download the Caregiver Sati app, which is a tool to help caregivers um, organize themselves. And you can actually have a journal on the app as well. So Rajalakshmi, you just asked me a very <laughs> question that I have a long answer. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for all the inputs. And we have, we can see the chat that some many have started subscribing it too. Lovely, lovely. And I hope that you will help us reach out to many others. And um, you know, we will and give us suggestions. What is it that you, if you think we could do, uh, you know, differently, more? If you want to participate in, uh, you know, the caregiver story, so we we have a video series called Gentle Warriors, where we feature caregivers and their caregiving stories. And, uh, you know, if people want to talk about their stories, we would love that because uh, one of the ways to heal yourself, you know, I spoke about heal thyself. One of the ways to heal yourself is to tell your story. So. Uh -huh. Thank you, ma'am. So if there is any there isn't any pressing questions, can we move on to our case presentation for today? <laughs> Either I was I didn't make any sense at all or I was very clear. I suppose you're very clear, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um happy to address any questions that you may have uh, later as well. 
So, um, you know, I can probably leave my email ID and you can reach out to me and I will do my best. Is that okay? And we will be sharing your contact details and email ID in our group. Uh, so all can write to ma'am if they want any more suggestions or more queries about caregivers. Sure. Uh, so we can move on to our case presentation today. It will be taken by Avatar Singh. Over to Avatar. Thank you, Babla ma'am, for such an informative session. I have learned a lot from your words. Uh, and uh, recently, just now, I have subscribed uh, to caregiversathi.com. Thank you again, ma'am. My name is Aftar Singh Chima from Chandigarh, Punjab. I'm a social worker working for palliative care patients, which in fact, I have really started since starting classes uh, with Pali Media. You are all my mentors, and I have learned a lot from you all. Please pardon my English in advance, as we often speak in Hindi or Punjabi over here. So let's start with the presentation. Uh, this case is about Mrs. M, who is just 32 years old, diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer with extensive spread and ascites build up very frequently. Mrs. M is currently undergoing treatment in oncology OPD in PGI Chandigarh and has undergone first round of chemotherapy just one week, one week ago. And today was her second day, but due to her frail health, she was declined chemotherapy today. Being on chemotherapy, she has a lot of fatigue, loss of appetite, weight loss, and constant vomiting. Now, uh, insights, please. Inside of the patient's world, Mrs. M and family are both aware of her diagnosis. Her prognosis is very poor, and further, after chemotherapy, radiotherapy is planned. And maybe after that, if her prognosis is okay, then they can plan surgery too. From a palliative care, uh, care point of view, social worker explained about the concept of care, uh, palliative care to both Mr. Mr. and Mrs. M, who is the primary caregiver, Mr. M. Other family members were explained about palliative care over the phone as no one came from, to Chandigarh to meet the patient. Now, please, family overview, please. Mrs. M is on her second marriage, and Mrs. M has a nine-year daughter, nine-year-old daughter from her first marriage, and her child has very stressful relationship with her biological father, Mr. X. Mrs. M was the primary care provider for the child and currently lives in one-room apartment in Jalandhar with her younger brother, who is 21 years old, and a 35-year-old elder sister, who is married in Mumbai, but due to COVID, she is stuck with uh, them in Chilandar. According to Mrs. M, she has a good relationship with her ex-husband's family. Mr. M, uh, patient's primary caregiver, works as a car washer uh, before he came for treatment with her in PGI Chandigarh. Now, eco map, please. Next, uh, ne next slide. Ma Going over eco map. Mrs. M had good occupation, spiritual and belief system, and is very trustful of social worker. She has a very weak friend circle, as no one stood by her side at the time of this crisis. She has very poor availability of health services due to financial constraints. Socioeconomical overview, please. Mrs. M was the primary breadwinner for her family, and Mrs. M was employed as loading and unloading goods in a private firm. She belongs to below poverty line category and has been registered under Ayushman Bharat Yojana for her medical support and holds blue card and gets free ration from various government schemes in Punjab. Uh, next time. Psycho spiritual overview. Mrs. M is in distress as she wants to raise her child by herself, but is depressed about knowing her fate going forward. Current husband, the primary caregiver, is upset with her condition, her ill condition, uh, since he is poor, cannot work, and thus cannot fulfill Mrs. M desires of healthy diet, etc. And his stress is immense, and he is also being neglected by the patient uh, due to constant nagging. Mrs. M is also worried about uh, her daughter's future, that who will take care of her after her death. 
Mrs. M has full faith and belief in God and had never blamed God for her faith. Our total pain, please. According to uh, total pain, uh, after chemotherapy, her physical pain is, her, uh, she has physical pain, constant tired, tiredness, loss of weight, uh, fatigue, loss of appetite. And uh, after she came uh, to know about her diagnosis, about stage four cancer, uh, uh, she is now distressed, detached, has a very low mood uh, and uh, fear also. Socio-economical situation is like that. Financial restrictions are there. They are unable to meet the expenses of the medications, unable to find the fund for diet, food, medicines, unable to provide adequate food for the child. Especially, she has very good faith in God and uh, has uh, hope that he will uh, sooner or later make, make her all right. Interventions. Social, social worker provided extensive counseling, especially ventilation of feeling to both Mr. Mr. M and Mrs. M, because they both are important. As just now ma'am told that caregiver, important, caregiver uh, is the most important tool if we want to improve somebody's health. Uh, the, secondly, there is a plan for a temporary job for Mr. M about doing uh, car washing jobs here in Chandigarh as, as Mrs. M gets better and have, have any relative with her in Chandigarh. Social worker also gave insurance assurance of educational support for the child through various NGOs and trusts. Social worker mobilized local community resources like charities, trust, and NGOs to bear the expenses, expense of medicines, medical tests, nutrition, and room rent, etc. Social work made them aware about uh, available government schemes which would benefit them. Discussion, please. Uh, my uh, discussion points are I are just uh, now all are answered by Bhavna, ma'am. But uh, some of, uh, um, but here are a few. Uh, means how you, how will you assess a caregiver's stress and pain level despite being neglected for whatever he does for Mrs. M? And secondly, my question is: caregiver has been verbally abused, humiliated, and accused for not providing enough care by uh, Mrs. M. What do you should uh, do? You suggest should be done to help caregiver enough so that uh, uh, enough uh, so that he should be give enough courage and support so that he could serve mrs m more selflessly thanks a lot thank you avatar for that case presentation so before moving into details about the discussion points i wish to ask all our participants any more clarification is required for this patient story Any more clarification about this patient's story? You can either unmute yourself and speak or chat to your doubts. So I think the patient story was explained very well. Uh, so Bhavna ma'am, I can we move on to the discussion points? Yes. Uh, so in this patient ma'am, uh, how will you access a caregiver stress and pain level despite being neglected for whatever he does for Mrs. M? So first of all, the first thing that I would um, like to know more about uh, is who is the social worker or who is the professional caregiver? The reason I ask that is depending on who we are, the type of person that I am, there are some parts of the story that I will pick up more than the other parts of the story. So that's the first thing that I would... Um, so you are the person intervening in this system. So yes, Akar, I would say that the kind of person that you are and how you are, every time you get into this system, your sheer presence impacts this system. And what you pick up about the case has a lot to do with the kind of person that you are. 
So uh, very comprehensive, uh, you know, recording of everything. But what is the choice that you will make? So for example, will you have first an individual conversation with both of them? And then maybe a dyadic conversation, which is make the two people sit together and be able to express what their needs, challenges, expectations, and emotions are. I'll repeat that. Patient and caregiver both articulate what their needs are. So my need, I need this. Challenges. What are my challenges? What is it that I'm finding hard? What are my expectations? This is what I'm expecting from you. And what was the fourth? Needs, challenges, expectations, and? Anyone? Even I've forgotten. Okay. What are my dilemmas and what are my emotions? So, needs, challenges, expectations, and feelings. A lot of times there is so much intensity of feelings that people don't have names to give to their feelings. So to be able to articulate what your needs, expectations, challenges, and feelings are or emotions are can form the basis for saying, okay, now how do we do? So like Vandana says, talk to both of them individually, help them feel around what their situation is, and then bring them together and say, okay, let's have a joint conversation. But all of this time, it is absolutely critical for you to be totally aware of who you are because you will be affected by the story. When you listen to the husband or the wife, depending on what your life experience is, something could get triggered for you. Something could get affected in you. So how do you manage yourself in the individual conversations as well as in the joint conversations can be a starting point. Another way to look at it is to say that, okay, how are you doing on the various aspects of total pain, for example, and what do you want to do about it going forward? So if on pain, your pain thermometer says you are at eight on pain or nine on pain, how can that be brought down to seven? And what can be done to bring it down to four? And that could be a very interesting conversation. What do you think, Avtar? Ma'am, I think that uh, I just want, uh, actually she's not worried about her daughter. Wow. So I just, uh, um, she knows that uh, her end is near. I just want that uh, I at least I should register her uh, her in some uh, good NGO or uh, she should be in in a situation that she can die very peacefully if uh, uh, if she think if she thinking about her daughter only actually she is always thinking about her daughter and nobody is coming from her native place to visit even once and she's here. Uh, since one and a half uh, one and a half months and they have been her second marriage uh, have been just for uh, seven to eight months yeah uh, just five or five to six months ago uh, she was diagnosed so if i i think they, uh, if i give her some comfort uh, that uh, uh, her daughter is is in safe hands or at least uh, she she will be uh, studying uh, in the in the future i think her pain level uh, will eventually go down according to me ma'am yeah but i think instead of assuming that it might be worthwhile to have a conversation with her and ask her that how she can make a plan what will work for her okay ji that's my view I'm happy to hear what others have to say. I hope, uh, you know, there are so many people who are so experienced in this room. So maybe some suggestions from others will be nice. 
actually i am i was very much in stress ma'am because uh, uh, this uh, this thing is affecting my life also because in pal- I, i never took a palliative care patient before and uh, i am a social worker i have just now and uh, i did uh, igno from igno i did uh, my bachelor's and now i'm pres- uh, going to pursue uh, msw but as for me it's all a whole new thing so uh, everything in my family is also getting affected but not in terms of depressing or something but uh, my mindset is going a little bit down i think so because uh, i have to work also I, i am working as a medical language specialist a medical transcriptionist and i have to concentrate on my work too so uh, these all these things are uh, stressing me out also so uh, i i think uh, here a lot of people are there who can advise me about this uh, you know, how should i proceed or how should i go with uh, this all this i'll wait for someone to speak up is there someone who would like to offer their advice so there are some comments of our um so um So there might be some other points of anxiety which is um you know the relationship between the stepfather and daughter and how can you involve some neighbor or friend and as we wait for some of the others to give in their points what i'd like to tell you is that one of the ways to approach this is um step back and go through that awareness cycle which is who are you you are a person who is new to such an experience uh, yes careful. but but uh, i want to learn also i want to help people also actually in previous sessions uh, smriti ma'am told i told smriti ma'am uh, once uh, once during conversation uh, in in some class also that uh, in punjab uh, mostly in punjab and all in, in our sikh community uh we we help a lot of people in uh, serving langars and uh, community kitchens and all everything we 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 help a lot of people uh, humanity is a main thing for us but uh, if i am um, if if i if i want to start a palliative uh, thing or palliative care uh, or i want to give palliative care to anybody anyone we uh, first i must learn then only i can Uh, tell others uh, others in my community uh, so that uh, we can all help community or uh, all humanity all together that that is my thinking ma'am i agree with you sir all i'm saying is just be cognizant just be aware of the fact that you are new to this practice that you need the support of maybe one two or three other people you have a huge learning cohort here maybe you can connect with a few others and uh, like alpha says in the chat box maybe first take a little break so that you can think clearly right so if you take a little break you will be able to think clearly and then you connect with two or three people take their advice and then take one step at a time which is why it is important to be able to recognize who are you in this situation the way that you will handle this will be very different from like say if alpha were in that circumstance or vandana was in that circumstance or linda was in that circumstance or vikas for that matter depending on what their own experience of life and education and life stage and whatever else has been and uh, your commitment and your desire is duly noted but you have to preserve yourself because if you can't be so affected by the first case that you're dealing with right yes so you have to look at what your care practice is take the support of some of the others and moshmi has got it she said your self care is so important so you you know you build your resources and then engage and i agree with you that maybe this lady's pain will be reduced if you can somehow help her take care of her daughter so ask around 
Yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, they had no money when they came uh, to Chandigarh. Some NGO, uh, some NGO was helping with them, and they told me that uh, they have no place to live also because uh, uh, PJ is going to discharge her uh, because they can't uh, because this disease is incurable. So what I did, uh, I I rented a room in a gurdwara in a trust. Uh, it's a trust taking gurdwara. I mean, in that uh, in Sikh temple, I registered a, a room, and uh, there from there uh, from there I am uh, from there man's uh, husband his uh, her husband is getting food, but for uh, her uh, for her sake to uh, give her good nutrition and all, I am preparing food from my own house and I am giving uh, daily three times. to her just uh, for, uh, just to uh, to the patient i'm giving food healthy nutritious food so that uh, she can uh, bear the chemotherapy side effects uh, right now i'm doing that you don't have to do this alone avtar that's what we're trying to say that okay. you don't have to do it from your own home you can ask for help and you can ask for funds and there are many ways in which you can generate some pool of funds and support and maybe five six families can come together and look after them and yeah and it's okay to be able to say that you know i can do only this much you have to as an act of your self care recognize your boundaries your professional boundaries are also important yes ma'am you're right ma'am and if you have to do this work and you know so how are you going to have a healthy balance you have to have a sustainable way in which to help patients like this i try i try to, not to tell my uh, my wife my son and my uh, even my parents uh, um, about all this that what i am doing uh, i just try to stick Uh, to what uh, gurbani says my uh, religious literature says that uh, how to how to be um, resourceful for a human other uh, another human being so i try to adhere to that i have been a patient of covid too i was hospitalized for one month and uh, in i think from september to october i was october i was there in hospitals and all so <laughs> i'm doing what i can do <laughs> that's all but, I, but thank you for your guidance uh, i'll be i, I have uh, registered myself that's why for uh, uh, caregiversathi.com so that i can uh, learn better how to do things in a systematic way thank you ma'am in a way to kind of consolidate the uh, the session today one of the things that i will have to um, highlight here and that i think came up in the conversation which is spiritual well being for professional caregivers is absolutely essential so avtar the gurbani also says that you have to accept the will of god yes ma'am right yes ma'am so you have to accept the will of god that not everybody and not everybody has as long a life not everybody is free of suffering everybody has their own journey and you do the best that you can yes ma'am you're right you have the responsibility towards your wife your child your life other patients and the only way that you can be responsible is by holding your boundaries yes ma'am Right? Uh, actually yes ma'am actually 7 to 8 years ago i lost my uh, uh, mother sister uh, due to cancer and she uh, she gave her life just in my arms i can i can i can't and whenever i think of that that trauma is still in my mind and i had a lot of therapy sessions and all uh, to uh, give it a way to go away but uh, i'm not able to do but so i thought of uh, so once uh, i heard about palliative care and all uh, when i searched over here here only in chandigarh uh, only 12 bed uh, red cross uh, healthcare uh, unit is there nothing else so all patients who are dying here and there I, 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 you can you know what i mean to say well that's the thing 
so first of all uh, you know um dying is the only reality it's going to happen whether we like it or not sometimes and not all the time dying can be pre prevented uh, or it can happen in only one way uh it sometimes it happens young and sometimes it happens in very tragic circumstances and that's that's what is life that's right and one of the things that i didn't cover in our presentation and i'd like to highlight is very often a lot of people become healthcare practitioners and i'm saying this with a lot of respect and a lot of love for people who become healthcare practitioners we become healthcare practitioners because we are hurting and we are in pain and the wounds that we carry from our life experience get impacted when we step into these very difficult circumstances so please don't be a wounded healer invest in yourself give yourself some time build your resilience build your heal yourself so if you've lost your mercy and that was an experience that caused you trauma heal yourself from it before you try and support others yes ma'am thank you ma'am thanks a lot okay uh thank you avata for that presentation uh, i just want to ask one more time like we'll have we have another 5 minutes for to log off uh, any pressing questions still pending you can ask her now regarding the patient story or the entire presentation i think we are getting very good comments ma'am i heal myself through this these sessions <laughs> we all have to heal ourselves there's no harm in it yeah we have to heal ourselves we have to seek help in healing and we can heal each other and uh, that's important and it has to be done on an ongoing basis it cannot be that you know oh i healed myself and then i'm done <laughs> this is that it, it doesn't work like that uh yeah when we love we feel betrayal because people who have compassion and who love and who reach out and make connection they get hurt they feel wounded and then they heal but i'd rather be someone who got wounded and healed uh, than someone who didn't even get into the arena right yes ma'am very very well said uh, so i think there isn't any much questions uh, we can wind up our session for today sure thank, thank you. you very much that was very thought provoking and uh, in many ways uh, very healing for me as well so thank you for that and uh, happy to take any further uh, questions that anyone may have so ma'am thank you so much for the wonderful presentation uh, these are all things which you mentioned we take it for granted every time but we understand the importance of it right now uh, so uh, we are sharing the feedback link right now we have already shared it give it a minute do it then only leave the meeting thank you ma'am once again and thank you avata for the presentation thank you so much bhavna ma'am Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we we are winding up the session for today, and then we'll be having a session uh, only on eighth of January. We will we'll not be having sessions for two weeks. So the topic will be positive psychology. Bye, everyone. Thank you. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year yes. to all. Bye.